Since India has opened its market to the global economy, there has been a substantial change in the pattern art and collectibles were seen in the subcontinent. One after another, major art events, Indian Art Forum, which started in the middle of the year 2000s, which later became Indian Art Fair, with the second edition completed of Kochi Muchiris Biennale, we see increasing number of collectors. Not anymore a uh, M.F. Hussain or Akbar Padamsi or Taib Mehta makes the headlines of the newspapers. There has been equally articles which are collectible are coming to the public domain. Be it the sword of Tipu Sultan, be it the objects used by Mahatma Gandhi. Indians are buying more and more collectibles. Today, we have Mr. Prashant Lahoti, the collector of Kalakriti Archives Prashant Lahoti collection. His collection of maps is so important that India's premier institution, the National Museum New Delhi, had opened its door for his collection to be displayed to a wider public. Mr. Lahoti, how did you start your collecting maps? It was quite accidental. Uh, I was in Edinburgh and I walked into an antique map shop uh, and suddenly I see lovely big Indian maps and I was floored by them. Uh, there was not enough time to buy the maps then, but when I came back to India, I contacted the dealer and slowly and steadily my collection started from them. And when you started collecting maps, what was the commercial aspect that you thought of? Did you ever think of reselling your maps or because I suppose that investing in maps and collectibles is a good amount of money. So how did you calibrate commercial aspect with your artistic inspiration? So when I started collecting maps, uh, the commercial aspect was never in my mind. It was only just recently when uh, the prices of the maps have gone up and the cost of acquisition of maps have gone up that you start on the hindsight start thinking that are you doing the right thing by putting so much of your resources hmm. into maps or collectibles. Uh, it is then only you think, otherwise till now I never thought that uh, on the commercial side of the collection. Now when you have acquired so many maps from different locations across the globe, you have bought in auctions, you have bought from private collection, I would ask a small question like in last one decade, how do you see the perception on collectibles has changed in India? See, I strongly believe that uh, as the economy grows and there's more disposable income and more h and are formed in a country, that's when people start thinking of collecting. It could be art, it could be miniatures, it could be sculptures, it could be collectibles like maps, photographs, vintage cars, wine for that matter which is cigars people collect so it purely starts off with the economy growing and when the economy grows more and more uh, museums and more and more uh, auction houses start putting those pieces into the market and that's how the whole thing starts off so when we are thinking of you know this collectibles in terms of economic growth it also points out also one aspect that is ex exclusiveness of the collectibles. For example, if we look at uh, Tagore's watch or Gandhi's specs, there is one single item. Whereas maps, they might have been also produced in multiple numbers. Then how do you establish perhaps exclusiveness, the rarity or the historicity? Because if we go by the common perception of collectibles, they are either sought after by the rarity or by the historicity. So how in, in because since you have collected over, I would say, thousands of maps, I would say that, you know, how do you prioritize on this on the basis of this rarity and historicity? There are four things which I find exciting in a map. Uh, the first is you find history in each map, for example. It could be how a city was, how it is transformed today, it could be the boundaries of different uh, princely states which change over a period of time, it could be the dominance and the occupation of European uh, 
countries and uh, trade uh, companies which dominated the Indian subcontinent. So it's changed over the last 200 uh, years and that's what you see in the map at, at different periods of time who controlled what, how the city was, the importance of the cities, the importance of the ports and all that you come to know the city. And regarding the rarity, it's very clear that big maps which were produced individually for the East India Company directors and for the important circulations are the ones which are very rare. The ones which were in books, which were printed for books are the ones which are not that rare because the books were survived the, uh, survived the time. Uh, while as loose sheets and rolled maps did not survive over time because they were used physically and they are very rare to find. Second is uh, during those period of time every map had a manuscript map from which the printing was done. So if you are able to find a manuscript map the rarity automatically comes in because that's the only piece available in the world. And while like you know you are perhaps one of the collectors in the country who has in possession maps not only in English or in French or in Dutch which has been perhaps the beginning of the cartographic practice in India. You have also the maps in Hindi in, on, of Jaipur or some Telugu map of the state of Hyderabad. So the thing is, I just wanted to know, how do you find them? When the Survey of India was formed, uh, they started making maps in local languages to satisfy the local diaspora. And what you find is, they are the rarest of the rare. So, for that matter, I have a map of Hyderabad, although it's much later in the 1900s, which is in Telugu as well as in Urdu. Or I have a map of Jaipur state, which is in Hindi, which was translated into Hindi on the request of the king of Jaipur that period of time. I just came across a map of India, a very rare map of India in Hindi, a wall map of India in Hindi, and which clearly states that it was made for the local people. Uh, it was a very uh, misshrewd perception that maps were only used by the Europeans. The locals also started using maps, seeing the Europeans' usage of them. And that's the reason there was pressure from the princely states and from the affiliates of the East India Company to make maps in the local language also. I'll just like you know you just said something very interesting which also refers us back to the exhibition that happened at the National Museum Delhi there is a French poem in which uh, Jean, Jean Pierre Dupré says once you locate a thing then comes the distance <laughs> without location you cannot distance I mean like cannot measure the distance similarly in this exhibition that happened at the National Museum of your collection Cosmology directly talks of a different sort of mapping. Whereas the cartographic tradition that started with the arrival of the Europeans, mainly for commercial reason, they have a completely different, like that, that is more realistic, that is related to navigating in the water or by land or finding out minerals, as you said, the survey of India. Now I would rather ask you to just talk about a little bit how you choose the cosmological maps when you buy them because that's a vast area. With the exhibition, uh, this all started with Kochi Binale uh, when we did an exhibition of cosmology to cartography. And what we did there along with uh, the two curators Vivek Nanda and Alex Johnson is we expanded the scope of cartography. Uh, cartography came in uh, mainly uh, at least the records show that cartography was mainly scientifically came in with the Europeans. Mm. The earlier ones were more uh, symbolic, more uh, abstract and more religious. Mm. So what we tried is from my collection, we tried to get the cosmic maps of the Jains, the pilgrimage maps of the Jains, the Buddhist maps uh, from uh, China and uh, Japan, uh, how they perceive the Buddhist world and the pilgrimage maps from the Hindu uh, mythology. So like one of the maps of the Ganga is from 
of the river Alaknanda from Haridwar till Badrinath. And what you see is, uh, it depicts each and every town on the way, each and every temple on the way. Hmm. The distance may not be right, scale-wise it may not be right, but the sequence of the route will be perfect. And we thought that's really very interesting uh, uh, concept to get into the cartography section. So we actually expanded the, this thing. So you even had maps of the temples, which was included in the section. So that's how we expanded the scope of cartography. So, you know, coming back to precisely, that's the point. The thing is, exhibition that you hosted in during Kochi Mucheri's Biennale 2014 edition spanned over a large collection from Jaina tradition, from Hindu tradition, to maps of rivers or maps of pilgrimage. In that case, how, as a, as a, as a, as a collector, how do you differentiate the price between the European cartographic tradition and Indian cartographic tradition? I'm asking you this question because the European maps have a direct link with its trade and commerce, its political might its political hegemony, whereas cosmological maps were completely rather done in a free spirit following the scriptures of the respective streak of thought. I would ask you like, you know, then since you have broadened the concept of cartographic maps or cartography or cosmology is being included in cartography, how do you make a selection over that? That is one thing I am like curious to know. Uh, during the exhibition? Uh, you may... No, I want to know in general because um, if I am not wrong, all these cosmological maps were either part of a larger manuscript or it was done with a very specific uh, intention of depicting something like the pilgrimage map. It's perhaps a standalone map. So how do you go about looking for them? Most of these maps are manuscript maps. They were part of temples, they were part of wealthy uh, businessmen who put it in the in their own house for uh, uh, worshipping or for seeing or showing it to their elderly that how a pilgrimage uh, goes about even if they are not going for pilgrimage it came from the courts it came from noble people and most of them you find them in auction houses and that's the best source uh, of finding them in the auction hall. I would like to ask this question now that, you know, you displayed your collection that has been developed, like, you know, over a decade at Kochi Biennale. And what was the response? How did it go well? I mean, how did it go with the, with the people who came to see? Uh, see, uh, in 2000, uh, early 2014, I happened to meet uh, Bose and Riaz uh, during a trip to Delhi. A trip to Bombay separately and uh, I just showed them what I'm doing you know just it was not I didn't have anything in mind that it could be a part of Koche Binale because nothing was clear and I just showed it to them that I'm doing this collection I have come to Bombay to meet one of the uh, dealers and, and and suddenly I get a call from Bose one day saying that the theme of the Binale is also cosmology Hmm. And can we have a show of uh, the maps in the Kuchi Binale? And I thought uh, it would be a very good opportunity for me to showcase my collection. But would people react to it? I was not sure whether people would react to it. But after the, the day the show started and we started putting up and when people started coming and seeing, I was really shocked by the response of people across the spectrum serious art lovers of contemporary art loved it, school going children loved it, people who were neutral to art and never seen anything loved it, students to businessmen to professionals to museum uh, curators, everyone loved the, the exhibition and that was a big eye opener for me and because of the Kochi Binale we could do it at the National Museum and Again, uh, it was a bigger eye-opener that uh, the response in Delhi was also amazing. The amount of people who have seen it, I understand people have come from Bombay, come from Chennai just to see the exhibition in Delhi. 
and that's really heartening and and that amazing experience also kind of led to the exhibition at the national museum in fact during the talk i am mentioning national museum too many times perhaps but it also indicates perhaps two specific characteristics of your collection number one is your collection matches the standards of national treasure so that it can be displayed in a national institution of national museum stature and the second thing which is very curious and my next question will be based on that that unlike many other collectors in the country who are never ready to share the collection with a wider public in a democratic space such as our public institutions of national museum igmca why you want to share your collection with the people around why you spent money went all the way to kochi mucheris biennale which is not a usual rendezvous for displaying collectibles why why this this outreach program what is your intention uh, there are two things in this i personally feel that art belongs to the public and if you actually see uh, the history art has somehow come into public space all over the world and it has to and if it has to grow and survive it has to be in the public space that is the first thing second thing i personally enjoy sharing my collection with people because i feel that if people can do research on it people can come and see it use it in different places the very thought of collecting collectibles or collecting art is per- percolated in the public if i i wouldn't have shown my collection in the public space uh, at kochi or at the national museum maybe they wouldn't have been other people now thinking of buying a map now i got so many calls from my friends in the art world who call me up and take advice can we buy this map is it a good thing to buy is it a good map is the cost right or not so that's something which i'm happy that is happened because of these two exhibitions and it's really important that the broader public is able to see it and enjoy it now i will come to a different set of questions regarding collectibles you and mr bharani's collection has been featured in national museum i would say that the state apparatus has shown interest in initiatives where individuals are spending their money to protect national treasure this is the way i would put it forward but when it comes to actual taxation system and the legalities the state does not give any impetus to the individuals or the private concerns or individuals who have been trying to protect and conserve and preserve indian culture there is a multi tier taxation system there is reptepism you have to take permission from multiple agencies i would ask your opinion see this is not exactly a a a, a question to a, a tricky question to get something out of you controversial but it is i just want to know if you have to develop a white paper approach to boost the collectible industries then what are the recommendations See, think, uh, that you would met we would have met like the sad part is that most of the surviving heritage of india is outside india for various reasons uh, first is when the english people the englishmen went back they took a lot of the collection with them the weather in european countries and uh, western countries support and support the i mean it's become easy to mm. preserve all this and it's preserved and the very mindset of the western countries to preserve heritage whether it be a family heritage or this thing with their family so in india what you find is is this the other way around first the weather is very extreme it's too hot some places it's too too much of humidity in the the thing so the paper and uh, canvas cloth uh, heritage doesn't survive second thing we have a habit that when we get a new thing throw away most of us throw away the old thing mm. so you do hardly find any at least in the map 
this thing you hardly find any maps available in india mainly because they must have been used and thrown away mm. in uh, this thing so a very very interesting case of a very very important map of calcutta which i purchased from a raddi person raddi wala in calcutta in a very very down very very bad so we don't give importance to heritage is never thought in schools it's never put into our uh, practice it's never done with anything so i think the government should encourage people who are getting things from outside into india by maybe going doing away with the customs duty and making it much easier to get these things back to india and it should be made more and more difficult for things to go out of india i think that's the first step the government need to take otherwise i know a lot of people who don't buy and get things just because they don't want to go through the hassle and the paperwork to get it back into india so you mean bringing back indian origin objects and collectibles should rather be looked at in a complete different light we should rather try to yeah. perhaps thought of like you know a national program because we are by doing it we are strengthening the cultural identity other emerging economies such as china in china if you have a private museum the land is given by the state you make your building you run it with your money but a huge like more and more you're entertaining people accommodating schools and educational institutions you get some kind of recognition and benefit from the state not monetary but in kind there i would like your yeah uh, so i wouldn't blame the government at all hmm. for very simple reason private museums coming into india is a phenomenon which is just a few years old i don't think 20 years back anyone thought of opening a museum and it could be a one off case i wouldn't say a one off case but if more and more people are thinking of uh, opening a museum then it's always get a better that we all go together and then go to the government and try to change the policies so i wouldn't blame anyone in the whole situation but i think uh, the way the philosophy is going into the country where i know a lot of people want to open private museums i'm sure the government would change their policies also okay but do you have any specific recommendation to make because you have an hands on experience so uh, see uh, i don't know about myself but uh, i can empathize with a few collectors uh, who would uh, rather buy a work for the collection than spend the money in the land and the building so if the government supports and identifies good collections across the country uh, which has see i mean again how do you classify a good collection uh, that thing comes up when the government is involved uh, very simple is i think it's a very simple method to do that uh, if your collections have been showcased in some of the important museums all over the world then you can easily identify that your collection is important you don't need a certificate from anyone else and if such people are encouraged and maybe given land or income tax rebate or uh, a special uh, uh, i mean a special uh, provision is created where if you're investing like in r&d if you invest you get 100% mm-hmm. rebate in uh, income tax similarly if you're investing in art and opening a museum then maybe you got to be given some rebate in your income tax i'm sure that will encourage and go a long way in opening more museums in the country this context can we because there was this deloitte report on art and collectibles that comes out every 2 years and it has been seen that in developing countries or um emerging countries like india has more number of people as you are confirming also that who would like to develop a collection so market wise where do you see this trajectory is leading to see uh, i think in one of the reports i was reading that out of 20 countries uh, hni surveyed they found that i think 9 to 10 percent is the total amount of the net asset value of the hni yeah. which has been invested in collectibles or yeah. art or something yeah the highest is in china hmm. which is i think around 15 to 16 percent and among those countries had india is on the bottom side with okay. only 3%. Okay. So if you take 200 HNIs or 500 HNIs of India and find out what is the 
ratio of collectibles in their asset, it would be just 3%. And sadly, most of that 3% is jewelry, gold and jewelry in India. Uh, the phenomenon of collecting collectibles, again, I would say is just last 10 years. It's not, I mean, there were people who were doing it, yeah. but it, I mean, it didn't have that magnificent, magnificent value in the market. Mm. So, if I can see, uh, if you go through the auction uh, uh, reports, maybe in the 50s and the 60s, MAF is sold at $10 and $20, which now cost 1000 to $2,000. Mm. So, the importance, as the value increases, the importance of collection also increases. So, it's purely, as the market economy grows, you'll have more and more people trying to take risks, putting their passion into the museums. Now, if you actually see uh, why museums, okay, uh, very interestingly, uh, I was told, uh, I mean, I read somewhere that you're not going to be remembered by the bag you carry or the car you drive after you die. What you're going to remember is the art you promoted. And museums make a person immortal. Yeah. And that only can happen once the economy is growing. Yeah. That thought can think of mm. something. And in the Muslims or, uh, yeah. uh, triangle, it comes when you have reached the top, that's when you mm. want to uh, self actualization and you want to be known, you want to be recognized, and that, that's all. So, psychologically, I think these two are collection and uh, this psychological things are somewhere connected. That's what I personally feel. You just mentioned something very interesting for us that the diversification of assets of you know, HNI or like, you know, how a high income group of the, like, you know, of the country, the way they diversify their assets. And I think it also points out a very significant shift, perhaps in post 2010 era, that Mr. Bharani's collection and your collection, Prashant Lahuti collection, got accommodated in the national institution. It already shows a change of perception from the state. When it comes to individuals, you know, high net value indi individuals, how do you think a perception change can be initiated? What is the role that the creative community has to play? What is the role that the state has to play? See, a state can only open its public spaces for individuals to show their collection. But if you look from the creative side and from the collector side, the more and more people open up their collection and show to people, the more and more people will get interest. Like I walked into a store in Edinburgh, saw the Indian maps on the wall and I was fascinated by it. And that's how the seed of collecting Indian maps started. Similarly, maybe 10 people have seen my collection and even, I mean, a thousand people have seen my collection and even if one of them gets the seed that yes, I should also start collecting maps. It's something very passionate. You're preserving the history of the country. You're preserving the growth of the country. You're documenting the growth of the country. I think half the work is done. Amongst your collection, which are the best specimens that you have? Uh, one of the, my favorite is the map of the Ganges, uh, which is a 16th, 17th, 18th century, 17th, 18th century map. Uh, which uh, is almost 20 feet uh, long. So that's my one of my favorite. Another uh, important collection which I'm quite happy to have is a Chinese map of the world. Uh, although it's a uh, reprinted edition of the early 20th century, but it's one of the rare ones. So that's something which is very, I'm quite, I really love. And now you tell me like if you are if you have to part with your collection and if you can just take, keep one, which one will you keep? I think the Ganges. Now, after Cochin Biennale and National Museum, what is your next destination with this magnificent collection? Tattoo, what happens is uh, doing exhibition uh, is a lot of, takes a lot of your energy, a lot of your financial energy, your time, your effort. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it takes away three, three or four months of your uh, life, and although it really rewards at the end of the year, but it takes away a lot of your energy. Second thing, because financially it's quite strenuous to the 
uh, the scene, particularly when the maps are 10 feet by 15 feet and mm. those things, shifting it, framing it, insurance, documenting it, coming out with the with this thing. I think I'm trying to go a little slow because I would still like to fill up some of my missing parts in my collection. So it's a giveaway okay. to that. But I'm already open uh, on giving parts of my collection which are part of a bigger exhibition around the world. So I'm already in touch, people are in touch with me from Paris, from the uh, different museums in the country to take a part of my collection to make and make it a bigger part of the exhibition itself. So in that case, like, can I also say, like, when you're talking of missing parts of your collection, so there is a set norm or set perception of a complete collection in terms of maps. Do you mean that as well? See, it's impossible to have a complete collection. There were lakhs and lakhs of maps produced, manuscript maps, printed maps. But there are some maps which, are, which have made landmarks in the history of cartography. And if you don't have that, then I think the map is, collection is incomplete. So I want to fill up those maps which have made landmark uh, in the cartography world. Apart from displaying it, what are the criterions that you set to a map when you pick it up? Like apart from the historicity, like do you also think there is a physical appearance that also gives you an appeal? Because you might be much more well acquainted with the legends, the, the cartographic symbols they use, how they developed. I have multiple answers to this question. First, uh, one of the reasons why I was attracted to maps was because I found it to be a piece of art itself. If you see the earlier maps, uh, you find the, the, camp, camp, the lovely campuses, the compasses, the lovely uh, cartouche, mm. the different animals, different places, different forts uh, drawn, uh, sea monsters and this thing. It, it gave you appeal. But what happens is as you start collecting, you are, as, as you become a collector, your focus and your interest changes. You slowly start graduating and maybe uh, uh, your focus changes. So right now, I my focus is on more rarer maps like the map of the cities, the map mm. of the provinces, uh, maps in local languages, which I feel are really very rare and important to be preserved for research and for documentation. Is there any other serious collectors of maps in this country whose collection has equally, like, you know, important, diversified, you know, the variety of maps like yours? I, I know quite a few people who are collecting maps, although I haven't met them personally, but I know they're collecting maps in different parts of the country. But one collection which I would say would be even more important than my collection uh, is the Susan Gole collection with the Arkazi Foundation. Uh, Susan Gole has solely been responsible for highlighting and documenting the cartography of the country. She has come out with three four books on cartography. She was the first person collecting and she had a passion for it. And this collection was acquired by the Arkazi Foundation. Uh, I think that's a very, very important collection just because it comes mainly from Susan Gole and who's, who's actually documented all the maps in the country. And I'm sure that she's put a lot of important maps in her collection. And you have also planned to put your maps on Google platforms, several Google platforms or Google Art Project itself, which is not very usual in our country, as I said before. Like, why you also want to put it on Google Art? What is the main purpose of taking rare paper version or cloth version of maps into a digital version where people might be able to copy it, people might be able to... So, as I told you, I personally uh, feel that every collection should be shared with the public, with the broader public. I mean, uh, people may not be able to, everyone is not able to travel out of the country or travel to different museums in the world or see different collections. But if you're going to the public, you're even satisfying the trust, the the thirst of the people who have liking for such things. And I thought putting it on a website is the best thing to do. So we started developing a website internally 
where we didn't want people to download the image for a very simple reason they should not misuse the image and still it is in the public domain and then suddenly i came come across an initiative by google called the google art project which is now called the google institute of culture cultural institute which is doing all the hard work of maintaining the back end which is not my forte to showcase all this work for the public and today we have already tied up uh, with google art project and very soon you will see a large portion of my collection the, the kochi binale uh, exhibition is already on the google art project and we have a app called kalakriti archives which can be downloaded by anyone and seen on the mobile phone the kochi binale exhibition can be seen on the uh, mobile phone also so very soon you'll have very rare maps from my collection onto the google art project and i would love to share with the public mr lahoti is perhaps one of the rare persons in the world of collectors who is willing to share his collection with a wider section of people be it kochi muchiris biennale which attracts the global art crowd to national museum which is also open to any citizen of india and has school children visiting he wants his collection to go and reach everyone so today the google culture institute has also taken a certain portion of his exhibitions for public display permanently we would like to thank mr lahoti for his contribution in safeguarding and conserving the national treasures and that he picked up right from the rack pickers to the international auction houses like christies and sotbis thanks mr lahoti